Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Dr. Silva and I'm going to talk to you about how to treat premature ejaculation. This is the medical model. When I was a medical student in the early 90s, they were still teaching us the coitus interruptus technique of addressing premature ejaculation by, quote, withdrawal and apply pressure despite the availability at that time of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Prozac was released in 1987 for the treatment of anxiety and depression. So while there are certainly various psychological and physical techniques that don't involve the administration of a prescription medication, the most effective foolproof method of stopping premature ejaculation can be found under the medical model. Paxil is what I'm going to talk to you about, and that one wasn't released until 1991, but, and so I was in, I was in medical school, yeah. Well, here it is. The drawbacks include the potential for side effects, and the fact that the treatment can only be prescribed by a doctor, and you have to go out and, and buy it, but it's very inexpensive. The benefit, though, is that it works every time. And you might even be able to take it on a PRN or as needed basis. Because the administration of a very low dose of an SSRI, such as Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Lexapro, Celexa, or Luvox, and for that matter, low doses of the Fexor, which is an SNRI, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, but which at very low doses doesn't block the reuptake of norepinephrine to any significant extent. That same could be said of Cymbalta. So any serotonergic medication, really for that matter, the tricyclic agents, any serotonergic medication that increases serotonin, especially by reuptake inhibition, the older tricyclic agents are not recommended for this indication because of the greater potential for side effects, even at low doses in those medications. I wouldn't recommend amitriptyline or nortriptyline or protriptyline, not for this indication, not with the SSRIs. One of the main reasons why people don't like to take SSRIs is because of anorgasmia. And here we're going to exploit that, what would otherwise be a side effect, in order to treat premature ejaculation. Delaying a person's orgasm, women who take SSRIs are equally affected by the way, is actually itself considered a side effect in the context of treating depression and anxiety. Because when you're treating those things, they don't have anything to do with the orgasm, at least not directly. But what's considered medication-induced quote-unquote sexual dysfunction in that context is actually the desired effect in the context of treating premature ejaculation and for individuals who have both in the case of premature ejaculation we're talking about men right only men experience that then you actually it could be a bonus if you've got a a gentleman who has depression or high anxiety who also suffers from premature ejaculation then it's two birds with one stone in this context, in the context of treating PE, the dysfunction is the PE and the medication-induced delay is a benefit. It's not a side effect, it is the effect that we're going for. That's the thing about medication effects, by the way, that it's not absolute. Medications have effects, and if we want them, there are beneficial effects, but what's a side effect in one person may not be a side effect in another person, not just this particular one, but like weight gain, it's the same. Most people don't want weight gain, but there are some people that, that do, that need to gain weight and that want weight gain. And so what's a side effect in one person is not necessarily a side effect in another person. There's nothing absolute about that term. At any rate, because such a small dose is needed, other what would be side effects, such as headaches, queasiness, diarrhea, or constipation, they're much less likely. And if they do occur, they're gonna to tend to be very mild and short-lived, which is true even at more significant doses, but especially because if we use Paxil, for example, paroxetine, which is the most potent SSRI in vitro, so it tends to have the most aggravation of the ability to climax. And so if we use that one, then we can use a very low dose of it and kind of avoid the other stuff, the queasiness and the headaches. So 
but even if you do get that, and you should take it with food when you start out for the first time, the body is gonna de quickly develop tolerance to those side effects. Delayed orgasm, however, is one of those effects, usually a side effect, that tends to persist. People usually do not develop tolerance to it, or not complete tolerance anyway. It might get a little better over a period of many weeks, but it doesn't tend to go away completely. And that's perfect for the treatment here because we want it to be a long-term effect, especially if the individual is taking it every day and not just as needed. You don't want to build up to steady state levels, so you're more guaranteed that it's going to work if you're taking it all the time. If you take it just a few hours before you have sex, you'll probably still experience it to some extent because it's, your body is that sensitive to it but you may or may not get the efficacy that you need. And sex can be very spontaneous, and so it can be hard to predict. But because the recommended dose is so small, we're talking about 10 milligrams or less of Prozac and Paxil, 25 to 50 milligrams of Zoloft, depending on your body weight and your volume of distribution, there will likely not be a significant change in your mood over the long term, but you might notice decreased irritability for sure, even at these very low doses, because that's also very sensitive. And there probably will be some subtle improvements in mood, particularly if you're somebody, say, for example, with endogenous anxiety, kind of pretty high anxiety at baseline. Even on these very low doses, you'll notice a diminution in anxiety and maybe other effects that you didn't anticipate. You might think to yourself, I didn't realize how high strung I was, or I didn't realize how uptight I was, or that that could be better, that that my shyness or my anger or whatever it is, that that could improve with, with just taking a pill. So you might notice some things even at these very low doses, but at first, what you're gonna mainly notice is improvement in premature ejaculation and irritability if you have that. So, but whatever mood effects you get, it, whether you notice them or not, are going to be beneficial because you're gonna increase the threshold, the physical threshold, for phenomena like tears, feeling overwhelmed, i.e. panic, and anger, frustration tolerance. So you'll have a lower propensity to worry, to become upset for any reason, to dwell, to future trip. You'll have a lot more equanimity. So if you're not clinically depressed or there's nothing seriously wrong with your mood, no harm is gonna come from taking an SSRI for this indication. And there won't be any long-term consequences when and if you decide to discontinue using the medication. Of course, as always, always confer with the prescribing physician. And if you are on higher doses, you will need to taper off because you don't ever want to abruptly discontinue a psychotropic agent, not a significant dose of one. But there can be brief rebound irritability or even anxiety if you stop this type of medication abruptly in SSRI. So your doctor might very well recommend lowering the dosage gradually over time before stopping it, especially if you've got a fairly robust an unanticipated effect on your mood. Like you didn't realize that you were having mood symptoms and you got a whole lot of improvement there and then later you decide that you want to stop taking it for premature ejaculation, then you really want to be careful about stopping it. Do that under the guidance of your physician and taper it if you're on anything more than a starting dosage. So it really depends on the dosage that you end up on. A family doctor is well qualified to prescribe SSRIs for the treatment of both premature ejaculation as well as uncomplicated clinical depression. So you won't necessarily need to see a psychiatrist for this. So you can certainly ask your PCP. Another potential side effect to watch for on these medications is weight gain, especially with Paxil and to a lesser extent, Lexapro and some of the others. Uh, Prozac, you're, it's a safe bet you're not gonna gain weight and effects are, I've, I've never seen it with those. But even at low doses, there's sometimes a significant change in weight. Weight gain due to medications is due to a change in appetite and it is not dose dependent in the vast majority of cases. But the change in weight will occur over time and it can sneak up on you though. You need to be mindful and you need to watch that and pay attention if you're snacking more or if you're craving carbs or if you're going back for seconds or whatever the case may be. You can always stop the medication early if it causes weight gain, five pounds of actual fat and just being mindful of that is enough to prevent any long-term weight change if you stop it as soon as you see that that's happening. Waking up in the middle of the night, it's called middle insomnia. That's another common side effect. 
and that could also last for several weeks on these types of medications. Again, the headaches and the queasiness and the diarrhea, if you experience them at all, tend to be very short-lived, but middle insomnia and terminal insomnia, where you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep, that can last a long time. So definitely let your doctor know about it. It is due to the medication if that starts to happen. Sometimes people have that as a symptom of depression or anxiety, but it's also a side effect of treatment with, with most antidepressants. And so if that happens, let your doctor know about it and there could be things you can do about that. That may be dose dependent and you can take an antidote for a little while if you need to. But most people on nominal doses for premature ejaculation do well exploiting the sexual side effect of this medication without reporting any noticeable changes in their mood, certainly no negative changes if they're consistent with the dosing. That's where taking it just here and there on an as-needed basis could be detrimental if you actually do need it or if you have a problem with irritability, like you have a very low threshold for irritability or you're always irritable in the mornings, for example, or just a little bit of a stimulant that makes you irritable, like caffeine even or you get really bad PMDD. If you, have, if you have really bad PMS or PMDD, if you have PMDD, you should tr get treatment for it. That's premenstrual dysphoric disorder. If you have just the premenstrual syndrome that a lot of women have, then also just be careful taking medications that can adjust your... Well, what am I talking about? Women are not gonna take it for this indication. They're not gonna take it for premature ejaculation. It's interesting, but, but women just don't get that, right? Because it, it, they don't get it. First of all, if they had an orgasm that was too fast, they could have another one. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's not a bad thing. And they don't, they're not done. The problem with men is when they have their orgasm, they, have, they enter an absolute refractory period in which they cannot climax again, and which further sexual activity is actually uncomfortable, can be painful, and they have to stop for a little bit. And then that's followed by a relative refractory period where it takes more stimulation for them to have another orgasm. But it's very hard for a man to have another orgasm. And if they have an orgasm before their partner, they might not be ready to go for a while. And so if they have one before their partner, well, that's why it's a problem. So it's never a problem for women, but so anyway, the medication is usually recommended to take once a day, every day, at a convenient time of day. But if you want to take them a couple of hours before anticipated sexual activity, see how that works out for you. You could experience complete anorgasmia. That's another complication of this type of treatment, which is the inability to climax at all. This is completely reversible for the vast majority of people. I believe in everybody, but... There are people that report permanent changes, and I think that there's something else going on there besides just the fact that they started to have that when they started to take serotonergic antidepressant. It's controversial, but that condition is rare, and it occurs in individuals that where there, there are definitely other factors going on, other variables, but it is dose dependent. So if you have complete anorgasmia, lower the dosage. Take that 10 milligram Pexel, and snap it in half, because if you have complete anorgasmia, then a much lower dosage will still give you the delay that you want without completely making it impossible. But you will get spontaneous improvement very quickly simply by holding the medication and just half your dose, try it again. Paxil again is the most potent, so it's associated with the most potent delay in my experience. Finally, another aspect of the quote-unquote sexual dysfunction that SSRIs cause involves decreased libido or sexual arousal, which I think could lead to erectile dysfunction in some men who already may be vulnerable to ED. Obviously, if this were a significant effect, it would obviate the usefulness of using SSRIs to treat premature ejaculation. But the thing to know here is that for the vast majority of men, including older men who may already be experiencing a significant degree of erectile dysfunction to the point where they need treatment for that, sex drive is strong enough that any amount that it's decreased on SSRIs is usually not a problem. If it's even noticeable, a lot of times men won't even notice it. 
Even older men who complain of erectile dysfunction don't complain with problems with desire. Usually when a man says he has no desire, it's because he's severely depressed. Because even a man who's very stressed out and who's anxious all the time, unlike women, most women, these are generalities, still is in the mood, right? And maybe even more so. So, And I've seen men, elderly men with dementia on hospital units, locked units, they don't even know where they are, and they're they're acting out sexually. So their sex drive can be until death for most elderly gentlemen and sexually acting out behaviors and inappropriate sexual behaviors in individuals with advanced dementia is a, a real problem. It's a common problem. But again, it just goes to show that desire in men is very, very strong. Unlike again, for most women that really see a drop off, especially in the postmenopausal period. So, and that's because men remain fertile until they die and women don't. It's the relative inability to physically respond to desire that's the problem for older gentlemen. Especially those that are hypertensive or have had untreated high blood pressure for a long time or diabetes or atherosclerosis, hypercholesterolemia, smokers, obese gentlemen, people who never exercise, etc. Similarly, an otherwise healthy male can experience significantly delayed orgasm with no practical effects on the strength of his erection and no problems with sex drive, per se. So these are compartmentalized functions. There are always exceptions. Discuss any notable changes with your prescriber, but rest assured that all of these sexual side effects are completely and rapidly reversible by lowering the dosage or stopping the medication entirely. And while there have been reports of this persistent syndrome of sexual dysfunction, there's just no recognized pathophysiologic mechanism for that. It makes no sense. Just, I, I'm very skeptical of it. But thank you for listening.